years ago, um, I knew Bernie when he had long blonde hair. <laughs> um, Bill Dreesen, how many remember Bill Dreesen? Yeah. Bill and I went to Nigeria years ago on a mission. We'd, we'd spent about three weeks in Nigeria, but it was, it was cheaper for us to uh, get a round-the-world ticket than to go to Nigeria and back, you know, to Lagos and back. So we, we went from, uh, we got KLM Airlines, the good Dutch airlines, to Amsterdam, and we spent a week in uh, Holland down at Venlo. Do you know where Venlo is? Down the south. And uh, anyway, we got the train from Venlo and we went up to catch the plane at Scropel Airport. And there's this guy, African guy, preaching the gospel in Amsterdam from Nigeria. So how do you reckon? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless me and help me, Lord, to bring your word today. Lord, I sense in my spirit, Lord, this morning that a new chapter is being turned over in the life of this fellowship. Lord, I sense, Lord, that you're, you're turning a page for a new, a new chapter in the history of this church. Lord, I feel it in the atmosphere of this place, Lord, that it's good. And Lord, I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness of Bernie and Susie and others that have stood through this church for many years. And Lord, you said uh, that you would bless those who are faithful. Yes. And Lord, I sense your blessing uh, on this church, Lord. I sense, Lord, that a new chapter is, is being turned. I don't know quite how to phrase it, but Lord, we, we're excited about what's going on and what's going to happen. Lord, excited about what you're going to do in the days ahead in this fellowship, Lord. And I sense, Lord, that, that some of the things that you're going to do are not going to be the same as they were before, but, Lord, you're seeking to bring in something new, Lord, and something, Lord, that has never been experienced in the life of this fellowship before. And so, Lord, I pray for the leaders and the Bernie and Susie, Lord, that you'll bless them, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you'll give them sense of, a sense of your word, your, your voice, you're leading, Lord, in these days ahead. Lord, because this church, Lord, is vital to this community. And so, Lord, we pray a blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so anyway, I uh, know oh Bernie said 44 years. That's how long Feli and I have been married. So we must have just got married. And uh, when we preached down in uh, Bernie's house, Bernie and Susie's house, 1982, was it? Oh, well, that's uh, a bit longer. We got married in 79. But when you look at this, it's amazing, isn't it, what God has done? And, and I, our sister was sharing about perseverance, and, and here's Bernie praying for perseverance. I thought, boy, he's the most persevering man I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But seeing today that uh, uh, you're inducting new eldership I felt the Holy Spirit prompted me to share from this psalm this morning. And I did share it many years ago for MFI when we met at Ross. And um, I felt the Lord reminded me and, uh, of this psalm again. And uh, I want to allegorize it a bit for what's happening today. And uh, because this psalm has been a great encouragement to me my, uh, in my own ministry, particularly in try to lead... Uh, uh, a local church, we need uh, the Lord's grace and help, otherwise we can burn out in the process. And so these thoughts, uh, they may not be new to you, they may be, I don't know, but when I was reading this psalm years ago, I got thinking about what makes a good arrow, and I want to share about that a bit in a moment. And I'm going to take the liberty of as I said, allegorising this psalm to a local church and its leadership to fit in with what you're doing today. And so I'd like us to look at the psalm, and I hope this will work. And uh, Psalm 127. Unless, everybody say unless. unless. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labour in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. 
It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of a womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. This psalm, to me, speaks that we should have our entire dependence upon the Lord. Hence the word, unless. The futility of rising early and sitting up late without God's blessing is hard work. God is working even while we're sleeping, I found. Praise the Lord. And we, we have to learn to put our utter dependence in whatever we do, wherever we are, upon the Lord. Because our self gets in the way. We have to get our self out of the way and, and do what that old hymn says, All to Jesus I surrender. Not part to Jesus, but all to Jesus, all to him I freely give. And I discovered over my Christian life, and it's taken me a while, that's the only way that Christianity works, is when you totally surrender your life and you totally are dependent on God and you find your resting place, your trusting place in the faithfulness of God. And one thing I've learned over the years is that God is a great arranger and he arranges things behind the scenes. And we don't always see what's going on, but behind the scenes, as we're just depending on God and and in, particularly in leadership of a church, as you're depending on God, God is working behind the scenes and arranging things. And then all of a sudden you find that God has done something, praise the Lord. It suddenly appears and you see how he has, he has worked. So unless the Lord builds a house, they labour in vain that build it. Years ago we, we came back from South Australia uh, we'd been part of Full Gospel Church for many years over, and then God in his uh, wisdom, uh, the company I was working for at the time, asked me to go to South Australia, but it was a God thing. God, God called us over there to go to South Australia because we needed to learn things over there spiritually that we weren't learning here in Tasmania. But anyway, cut a long story short, while we were away, the church went down. The church had a lot of trouble. I'm not going to go into details, but it wasn't the same church when we came back. And how the God brought us back, he crossed the I's and he dotted the T's. No, dotted the T's. <laughs> crossed the T's, <laughs> dotted the I's <laughs> to bring us back. So we knew the Lord was bringing us back, but um, we didn't come back to work in the church. We were just going to help out like we'd always done before. And at the same time, I was starting off a, a fire protection company here for my brother. That, he was the one who paid our way back, and that was the, what had a job. Anyway, um, after about six months, of being, uh, uh, we were asked to leave the church. And uh, I'd never led a church before, and I felt totally inadequate. I, I didn't know really what to do because I'd always been an associate role. I'd always been an assistant role. All of a sudden... You know, I was, in, I was now the head guy sort of thing. It was, it was hard work trying to rebuild a church and also to start a company. But anyway, and build a business. But anyway, God was faithful. God, God helped me a lot in both things. And, and, the, and it was, at a time came, I was able to hand the company over and then go into the church, you know, full time. Uh, but leadership's not easy and... and uh, I was praying to the Lord and I was crying out to God because the church wasn't growing and I, I wanted the church to grow. How many want the church to grow? Yeah. Hallelujah. I was calling out and I was in prayer and, and the Lord spoke clearly to me and I've never forgotten it. He said, I never called you to build the church. I will build the church. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Do you believe that? <laughs> and that, that I, I shifted over in my heart and... Uh, I just depended on the Lord uh, to build the church. And he started, he turned it around, praise God. And I sense something of that here that, that you just believe God's going to do it. Hallelujah. He, he's in the building business. And Moses was like this. 
you know, he said, I can't carry all these people by myself. It's too burdensome for me. And if this is how you're going to treat me, please kill me right now. That's the pastor's prayer, you know. Did you know that? It's the pastor's <laughs> prayer. The church, the church wouldn't have any problems if there was no people in it. So anyway. But you might remember, you remember Jethro's Moses' father-in-law, you know, when Moses was sitting up all day and he was talking to people, he said, oh, that's not very good, you know, you should sit, you should put people in different groups, sizes. You know the story, don't you? And he put some over a thousand, some over hundreds or whatever, and Moses only did the serious ones himself. But this is after, this is after that. Jethro was man's thinking. Jethro was man's organisation. Jethro was, it was a good idea, but it was an organisation by a man's mind. And you've got to have that in the church. You've got to have good organisation. But Moses still, even after all this, said, God, kill me. And then what did God say? Gather 70 men of the elders of Israel whom you know. And he said, bring them to the tabernacle and I'll come down and talk with you there and I'll take the spirit that's on you and I'll put it on them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Praise the Lord. So all of you that are going to be elders today, you should learn and you should endeavour to catch the spirit of what Bernie has where his heart is, where he wants to go in the church, where he wants to lead the church. You catch the spirit of the senior man. Hallelujah. And uh, you, you have a teachable spirit. You're not know-it-alls. You're not, you don't have all the answers. But you get behind the senior man and try to catch his heart. And, and your job, I believe, with Bernie and all that he's gone through and as a leader, you have to make things easy for him. Can you give me an amen? amen. Your job is to make it easy. Because Bernie runs around like a chook with its head off. <laughs> Quite close. He's always been a goer, a go-getter, a builder, a doer. But I don't think that's wise anymore for Bernie. You as elders need to be make things easy very, very easy for him until the Lord does something else. Can you give me an amen? amen? Praise the Lord. So, unless the Lord builds a house, uh, I don't know if you thought about arrows much, but uh, um, it says here, unless the Lord builds a house, this psalm says, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them full of leaders. In 2 Kings, we have an account where Elisha, who was nearing death, commanded Joash, remember the king, uh, the king to uh, take the arrows, and he said, I want you to take the arrows and I want you to strike the ground with the arrows. And the king struck the ground three times. And and Elisha rebuked him. He said, you should have struck it more times. He said, if you had struck it more times, you would have had a greater victory. And he rebuked him for his small faith. And it reminds us that in prayer, we serve a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And Andrew Murray, the great South African from Dutch <laughs> heritage... He said, when you pray, pray big. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? And God can do what we cannot do. And sometimes we put limitations. Years ago, I was preaching about that man that they dropped through the roof, you know, that story. And, uh, and they said, Jesus said, which is easiest, heal the sick or forgive sins? You know that story, don't you? The Lord, the Lord spoke to him and he said, $30 or 30 million, doesn't matter. You know, to us, it's a lot. Which is easiest for God, $30 or $30 million? Doesn't make any difference, does it? God can do it, you believe that? It's no big deal to God. To us, it is. 
But to God it's easy because he can do it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's so ask big. You know, strike the arrows. Strike the arrows. Praise God. You know, and the David and Jonathan, you know David, he was Saul. Jonathan was King Saul's son, you know, and he wanted to kill David. He was jealous of David. But Jonathan, the king's son, made a covenant with David. You know the story, don't you? And uh, how many know about Mephibosheth? Yeah, praise the Lord. Say Mephibosheth five times real quick. (laughs) And Jonathan's plan to protect David was that he'd shoot arrows, remember? Shoot arrows over and he'd send a boy. You know that story? So yes, Jim. And that, then David knew that he would be safe. And so there's a story. And uh, King Saul, ended, his sad life was ended in the battle when it says he was bitterly wounded by arrows. And of course, Paul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin, the Benjaminites were archers in the Old Testament. Did you know that? And he said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. And he said... Take up a shield of faith, which will be able to quench all the fiery arrows of the wicked one. Praise the Lord. So let's have a look at this uh, this psalm, Uh, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labour in vain. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, which is a senior minister I'm putting, allegorising, so are the children or leaders or sons in the faith. Happy is the man or the senior minister or pastor has his quiver full of those, full of leaders, people of faith, workers, reliable, trustworthy, faithful, people that stand with them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Praise the Lord. And so Jesus builds a church. He does the possible. How many you know that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, He could have moved the stone as well. Is that right? But he didn't. What did he say? You move the stone. So he does the impossible. He raises the dead. We move the stones. We do what we can do, and he will do what we cannot do. Praise the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. And so this morning I want to look at what makes... What makes... A good arrow also makes a good leader. And so like hands, arrows in the hand of a warrior. So the first one is it must be able to fit in the quiver with the other arrows. Building a local church goes without question that we must be in unity together. God blesses unity. More than one vision is division. And so if we we can have diversity of opinions... But in church, you need to keep the big picture in mind. And I've been in ministry a long time and I've seen people get divided over all sorts of trivialities in church that are not important. And so as a church, it's important that you keep the big picture in mind and don't get diverted off the main goal of what you're about and keep in unity. Praise the Lord. A lively church is which has many people involved in its life and being placed in the quiver of a local church means sticking at it in all seasons of life, putting up with one another. And I know that in this church there are people here that have been through every season of this church. And uh, when I went to Harrow, the Lord called me to Harrow Church of Christ, there was only 28 people left in the church. But you know those people are worth their weight in gold because they stuck with that church. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I had great respect for those people. They didn't know a lot about the Holy Spirit or anything like that. They actually are starved for the word. But I tell you one thing, they stuck with that church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so we speak the truth in love. We grow up in the things in the head of Christ. And Paul says, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effectual working by which every part does its share, causes growth. Praise the Lord. The other thing about an arrow is it has to be straight. Amen? Not crooked. 
Individually and corporately as believers in Jesus, we must have and hold on to core values that we never compromise. In representing Christ, we do it well, we do it the best that we can, but we do it, we do it with integrity. Praise the Lord. A leader must have integrity. He must be trustworthy. He must be double he mustn't be he mustn't say one thing and do another. Praise the Lord. Sin is described as missing the mark or being off the target. And so as leaders, we have to be like a good arrow, not crooked, but straight. Can you give me an amen? amen? Praise the Lord. And so all of us mess up. How many have messed up besides me? Okay. But we don't want to stay there, do we? It's not our home. We all, we all make mistakes, but we don't feel comfortable back there because our old man's been crucified with Christ. We want to live for Jesus, praise the Lord. And so we're not perfect, we're still going on. But a good testimony, we should have a good testimony because of our integrity, because of our honesty, praise the Lord. You know, the, Paul talks to our sister shared out of Romans and, and Paul in Romans chapter 2, he tells the Jews, he said, the, the people are blaspheming my name because of you, because of your lifestyle, because you say one thing but you don't do it. Praise the Lord. And so we want to we want to be a good, an arrow has to be straight, have a good testimony, have integrity, be honest. Praise God. Amen. I see you're all very excited this morning. <laughs> arrow, an arrow has to be balanced, not subject to extremes. You know, we believe in the whole word of God, not just a point of view. And so we're not to lift one point part of the God's word above another. And so I've been around long enough to know that the Holy Spirit sometimes moves in a, in a community or moves in a church and you get an emphasis on a certain thing. You'll, it'll come into the church, you know, and uh, when you look back, you can see how the Holy Spirit has it been emphasised certain things in the life of the church. And, uh, and so we can go like a yacht, we can go with the wind that way, and that, but we've got, to cut, we've got to keep on course and keep come back. Uh, amen? So we don't sway off course, but we, we keep going where we are, but we go with the flow of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit might emphasise certain things at certain things at certain times, but we have to keep things in balance and not be extremist, praise the Lord. And so Christians are very good at finding hobby horse doctrines, you know, but it's not healthy to build a church around a particular voice, point of view. We have to contend for the faith, praise God. And so we know we have to earnestly contend for the faith, not just some bits that we like. And uh, Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And he told them, well, some say Elijah, some say this, and somebody said, but who do you say that I am? You've got to be able to answer that question, both, both with your own testimony and with, through your own biblical knowledge. That you, if somebody says, who is Jesus? You can tell them. Amen? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is he to you? Praise God. And so... You've got to hit where it's aimed, not swayed off course. And so a good arrow learns to submit to the, uh, to the church life. It, it doesn't mean, submission doesn't mean subjugation. It means that you fit in. You fit into what the church is, like a stonemason would fit in stones in a, in a wall. Uh, you know, you, you make a stone fit. We're not bricks, we're living stones. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so... We, we, want to, we want to go where the church is. We're not swayed off course to some other thing. Praise the Lord. We're staying on course works because it works on our selfishness and our ambitions and all those sorts of things. I remember as a young man and in the Lord growing up under Peter Mullen. Well, Peter Mullen wasn't the best organiser in the, in the world, you know, but he was a good teacher of the word and everything. And uh, I was just a young man and I thought, well, I knew it all and I could do things better. But I had to learn, I had to learn to fit in with him. I had to submit under him and I had to learn to serve him. I had to learn to wash his feet, as it were, 
praise the Lord. And I believe, you know, it kept me on course and it worked on my selfishness, it worked on my self-life and killed some of the old Jim, praise the Lord. Amen? And so it's important as arrows that we, that we if you like, the, the birdie can say, I want you to do this and you do that and you hit the mark of what he's asking you to do, praise God. Hallelujah. Can you give me an amen? Amen. And we don't want to be swayed off course. And so four and a half years ago, God called me, this Pentecostal preacher, to this, this very traditional, very, very conservative Church of Christ in Hara that were Father, Son and Holy Scriptures. And uh, <laughs> they, they were... They, they took a courageous step to invite and call a Pentecostal minister to that church. Imagine, they brought up with no, basically most of them taught that the gifts of the Spirit weren't for today. And so they, they, they asked me to come and uh, that church was broken. That church was discouraged. That church had no direction, no vision no leadership, everyone had their opinion, everybody, we should go this way, we should do that way, you know, uh, and not everybody was agreeable for me coming, can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, I'm one of the most humble people you'll ever know. <laughs> and... Uh, but I went there with one thing in mind, was to love those people and preach the word. Amen. Hallelujah. And I didn't try to make that church anything else. I just trusted the Lord to build that church. I said, Lord, I can't do it, but you can. And I trust the Holy Spirit. And then when I went there, the Lord gave me this scripture. For there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, that will sprout again and its tender roots will not cease. Though its root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die on the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a pear. And I knew that the Lord gave me this verse, and if I trusted the Holy Spirit, that scent of water, that old stump of a church would sprout again. Praise God. And God did it. God did it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that's the same for here, any church. There is always hope in God. It doesn't matter. Churches go through seasons. Sometimes you go through winters and it's like there's nothing happening. But don't worry about the winters because spring comes around. Hallelujah. And God will, you stick to God. God is a great arranger, like I said. And if you trust the Holy Spirit, he will do it. Praise God. And so, good leadership for every church. Lift up your church in prayer. Envision it with new dreams and possibilities. And you trust Jesus to build as he promised. I know doors will come. Doors will open. Opportunities will come. I sense that God wants to do something that he hasn't done before. Hallelujah. Get ready for some of God's surprises. That's what I think in my heart. Praise the Lord. And we need, to, we need the mould, the routine broken off our lives it's because sometimes we box God in. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Who would have thought that I would have been leading a, leading a church of Christ? You never would have known, would you? Praise the Lord. I told him... Uh, I told him I'd like a painting of me in the foyer like this, looking down at people coming. <laughs> but the psalm says, Behold, children are a heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Things bubble up. Things bubble up, I've found, in church life. Hallelujah. When you part with Jesus, he'll fill the nets. Praise God. So... You know, live in anticipation. Expect, lift your expectation in God. Yeah. Hallelujah. And uh, doors will open, new life will come. Opportunities you never thought of will happen. 
Praise God. I believe it. Amen. And, uh, you know, keep the big vision. Got to have short ones along the way, but, you know, I just sense, a, I really sense like a new chapter burning. Praise God. And I saw all those kids up the back there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Anyway, like hands in the arrow, in the hand of a warrior. Uh, a harrow, an arrow has to have the ability to fly. So we need to be, we need to learn to hear the voice of God, subjectively and objectively. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And all the sheep said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> God speaks you all the time. And so we need to, Christianity is supernatural, isn't it? We serve a supernatural God. And, uh, and so we need to learn to hear that the voice of the Lord, which is so quiet in us, those gentle impulses of the Spirit, and uh, takes time to learn to have that sensitivity to His voice. And if you're in leadership, you need to have that. You need to have not just be a, a mind person, but a mind person filled with the Spirit, praise God, together. And, uh, and believe in a supernatural God and, and trusting the Holy Spirit to give you sensitivity to his voice. The other one is you have to have a sharp point, able to cut it in the spirit. It's, if we're not careful, we, we all become dull. If we don't, if we don't watch ourselves, we become dull and spiritually dry. We can become religious. We just go through the motions. But we, we need to... What Hebrews says, lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Make straight paths before our feet. Hallelujah. How many know you never exhaust God? You never stop knowing about God. Tozer said we can know as much as, as God as we want to know. Hallelujah. And I often meditate on that, on that prayer of Paul's where he talks about the love of God, how high it is, how wide it is, how long it is, you know, how deep it is. And, and he said, to know what cannot be known here, but can it be known here? And then he, he finishes with this phrase, and oh man, sometimes I just think about that and think, oh, do I really know this? You know, it, it, what he was saying, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. What is to do that, Lord? Fill me with all the fullness of God. Oh, you ever thought about that? Yeah. Making us sharp. Keeping us sharp. In love with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with Him. Ecclesiastes said it's hard to cut wood with a dull axe. And so we encourage it to walk in the Spirit. Keep ourselves spiritually sharp. And... Uh, have ongoing encounters with the Holy Spirit. How many love to have encounters with the Holy Spirit? Praise God. Hallelujah. Times of refreshing. Then an arrow needs to be, have authority. Arrows of offensive weapons. And we're encouraged to stand and having done all to stand, not to give ground to the enemy. God has given us authority as believers to use the name of Jesus, the blood and the word of our testimony, to know who we believe in and why we believe in him. Hallelujah. And to use his name and use the power of the blood and the power of the Holy Spirit to take authority, to break through and things. Hallelujah. And so as elders and, and that when you come together, and even as a church, you come together, you don't just say prayers, you pray. Hallelujah. You're not just there to say prayers, if you know what I mean, but to pray, to battle with God, to break through and take authority and rebuke the enemy. Hallelujah. Take ground. Don't give up what God's given you, but fight through it by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I know who I believe in. Hallelujah. I know he's Jesus, the King of Kings. Hallelujah. We take authority over the power of the enemy. Praise God. You know that. And that's what you've got to be like, a good arrow is like, they know Jesus, they know the power of the word and the power of his name which is above 
every name. Praise God. Psalm 45 verse 5 says, Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so, able to fit in the quiver, unity and fellowship, straight. Everybody say straight. Straight. Honest, not crooked. Balanced, not subject to extremes. Hit where it's aimed, not swayed off course. Have the ability to fly, sink it into the spirit. Have a sharp point, keep yourself sharp in the Holy Spirit. Filled with all the fullness of God. And know who you believe, praise the Lord. Amen. Did you get anything out of that this morning? Now this is how I see the arrow doesn't come up there very good, but anyway, this is how I see and how I've endeavoured to lead a local church. When I went to Harrah, under their constitution, they had the elders over the pastor. You know, they controlled everything. They, they were the ones... I call them permission givers. You know, they were the permission givers. And I said, I don't like that at all. Um, I said, uh, and I explained this principle. And so this is how I see it, that the senior pastor, he's the main vision caster. He's the one that gets before the Lord for the direction of a church, uh, to see where the Lord wants to take the church where he believes God is speaking in relation to the church. And so he's casting vision, but he's not a dictator. And everybody said? (laughs) That's not important. But the elders are the feathers at the back of the arrow. And so we bounce things off the eldership. That's what I did. I would bounce them off and I say, what do you think? They would give me their input, whatever. But together, like one big arrow, we're moving forward in the things and the vision, the direction of the church. And so the elders have to be people that aren't permission givers, controllers. Can't work under people, uh, controllers that are power hungry. You know, that want to dictate things in the, in the eldership. Won't work. You have to come together under one vision. One mission, balanced leadership. Praise the Lord. And so a local assembly needs lots of arrows, persons who hit the mark of maturity. This is a blessed church. And it says, that that psalm says, that church will not be ashamed but will overcome the gates, the council, the dominion of the enemy of Christ. Hallelujah. And so I believe that... uh, that the Lord wants to bring new, a new level of victories, Bert Bernie. There have been, there been a few defeats here and there, uh, a few things that have discouraged you, but I sense that uh, as you got this mighty quiver here today of a new eldership, that uh, together you can hit the mark of the prize of a high calling in Christ Jesus. And, and uh, I, I believe that you're going to see great, many more victories, yeah. not defeats. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Can you give me an amen? amen? Hallelujah. And so this morning I believe you want to pray for elders. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for, the, for this church, for its testimony. Lord, when I think about when years ago when I preached for the first time in that home of Bernie and Susie to see what you've done here through the ministry of this couple, Lord, it's amazing. That's all I can say. It's amazing. And Lord, even though you have done many great things and many lives have been touched through the life of this church, yet, Lord, I sense there are greater victories yet to be won. And Lord, that greater conquests will come out of the the ministry of this church. And Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of Bernie and Susie and the faithfulness of those that are stuck with this church over many years. But Lord, I I sense in my heart a new chapter. 
I feel I see like a book and I see like the Lord just flipping a page over in the spirit like a new page just be turned over like that and it's a whole new chapter in the life of this church hallelujah and it, the title of the chapter is victories in Jesus hallelujah hallelujah victories hallelujah praise God praise God hallelujah thank you Lord thank you Bernie